God's doing a lot of great things, and um, one of the great things he's enabled us to do is support George Saylor. Um, I didn't know George real well. I knew his family, but I, I think between me being in college and up here at Westmont and George growing up at Emmanuel, I didn't see him a whole lot. But uh, you can read the bullet. I'm not going to insult your intelligence. You can read all about George uh, there, and um, you can greet him after the service. But George was coming in for his mom and dad's 50th anniversary celebration, and um, I had to laugh because Phil was all about playing his, I think, fiddle, uh, and uh, he asked Tony to play with him last night at the dinner, and he said, our name of our group will be Sailor and Santo. Is that okay with you? So I don't know if Tony likes second billing or not, but he got it. <laughs> but this is George Saylor, and you can read. We have had the privilege of supporting George the past three years. George and I have emailed and talked on the phone occasionally. And um, so we've been supporting the church, and George was coming in and said, I'd like to thank the church for their support. I said, you can do more than that. You can preach. So let's welcome George Saylor to uh, West Hills. Thanks, David. <laughs> Well, it is a delight to uh, have this opportunity. And uh, a couple introductory remarks. Um, you know, first, uh, I know what it's like to show up at your church and, and, and not have your, your beloved pastor, you know, preaching. So I, I'm sorry. You showed up and you thought you were going to hear David and this guy stands up and now you're supposed I mean, I, I, but you know, give me a chance. Before you write me off, give me a chance. Maybe, just maybe. God has something in store for you today. Uh, I, God is surprising me in the, the, this trip already. I mean, this is my old stomping grounds. I, I remember, and then that, was the, that wasn't the Valley Dairy. It was the Dairy. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I, mean, I remember that when I was a kid. On, and I headed up this road to go to high school, and I'd go by David's old church, the little Baptist church up there, up, in the, up, in the, up on the hillside there. I remember those days. I mean, just like it was... Just like it was yesterday. I mean, so this is, and, and I got to tell the truth about that. I had no idea this church was back here. I mean, I, I, you know, I, would, I had no idea. And now to see uh, what, what God is doing, you know, around that turn on Sunshine Boulevard here and to see what God is doing, it just, it just blows my mind. And to him be the glory, because I would, I mean, I would have never predicted that. I would have never bet on that. And to see what is happening here and to see you have more projects in the works and, and to know that your faithfulness has enabled me to do what I do. I've had an interesting journey, and again, I could, you know, bore you for, for a long time with it, um, but I, I even saw that you're supporting uh, the CCO ministry back there. I saw that's where I got my start. I have to, out of college, I did a couple years of CCO ministry at Allegheny College. My wife was doing ministry at Geneva College outside of Pittsburgh. We met, we married, pastored a church in North Carolina. I had the opportunity to move to Canada and plant a church there, and that was an amazing run, and God did amazing things there. And I, and I had a dream. If you would have talked to me as a kid uh, ages ago, I would have said, I want to end up like Andy Picking and other friends. I see his parents here uh, with us this morning. I said, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end up out, out west someday. I mean, we took some ski trips out there. Uh, I'd done a number of bike trips out there. And, and before I knew it, though, I was turning 40 years old, which surprised nobody more than me that I was turning 40 all of a sudden, but I, I said, I've, I've got to get to Colorado. Uh, and, and God uh, was able to open a door, and we just went there with the dream of, of starting a church. And, and again, these, these are details you might not necessarily care about, but they, I think they matter deeply to our Lord, and they matter deeply to me. Um, Denver is the fourth most unchurched city now, tied with Las Vegas uh, in America. Uh, so it is a growing city, and therefore it's a thriving city in, there, in, in many ways. But people aren't going there to find the Lord. People aren't going there to find God. If anything, they might be going there to escape some things from their, from their past. And so we had a vision on the front range to say, if this is a growing area that's losing traction with the gospel, well, we need to come in and have gospel-centered, Christ-centered churches trying to reach new people. It had been a hard run. And, and, and honestly, again, you're, again I, I realize most of you, who is this guy and why is he here? You, you don't know it. Maybe you never put it together. I'm going to put it together for you. Simply by your faithfulness to give as an act of worship to God, you enable people like me to do what we do and to go from nothing to where I'm at now. 
and it took uh, three years, but we've been having some breakthroughs recently. Uh, a, a, a church in the area that had been in uh, a decline, and they would be the first to admit it. They, they didn't know if they're going to sell the property or, or what they're going to do. We ended up merging. We ended up coming together. Uh, we're already putting a, a great plan in action. We're going to re-emerge uh, in September as Connections Church. Church is coming together. Uh, and and I, the end of the result is this. Here, here's the celebration that, that you all have been a part of making possible. Next week, whenever I get back, we are having our first baptism service as a merged congregation, and we already have four adults who are coming forward to make their profession of faith and receive believers' baptism. And that would not have happened without you, because you gave and your church saw fit to support other churches that want to make a difference. So thank you. Thank you from the bottom of my heart, and, uh, and I would like to say that soon we'll become a church that will support other churches, so, you know, it, it, in the near future, pay it forward. Pay it forward and bless somebody else the way you have blessed me. Okay, well, with those opening remarks, uh, when we merged and got this facility and things started happening, I, I just did probably what every new church does that, I mean, I don't know, David did in some way probably does, we got to go to the book of Acts. I'm guessing at some point in the beginning, you said, well, we're going to go and do a couple. So I said, we're going to go to Acts because Acts is about the birth of the church. It's often called the Acts of the Apostles or the Acts of the Church. What I've done for the last three months, though, is I've said, these are the Acts of the Holy Spirit. We're usually pretty good, usually, most churches, at saying it's all about Jesus. Jesus is our Savior. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is life and life eternal for, for all of us. But how do we know Jesus? We know Jesus by the filling and the fullness of the Holy Spirit and his work in our lives. So I said, we have a precious, precious book. We have the Gospels of Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We have some incredible letters, epistles that help guide the church and direct our ministries. Without Acts, we, we have a gap that we wouldn't really know how it begins. And so we've been going, you know, again, three months digging deep into the beginning and what kind of church do, do we want to be. Now, the bad news, of course, for you is now I have three months of preaching I need to cram into one morning here, but I'm going to resist that urge and just kind of bring you up to speed and, and, and just share a message that ended the series about the last two chapters of Acts and about a very infamous shipwreck. Now, the short title of this, of course, then would be Shipwreck, but the long title, the, the, you know, the, the expanded title, the subtitle for this might be The Apostle Paul Called by God on the Move, Being Sent, Only to Find Himself Arrested, Betrayed, Beaten, Flogged, Stoned, Stripped Down, Hungry, Thirsty, Naked, shipwrecked, abandoned, on trial, uh, and on top of all that, to get bitten by a snake. If you don't know the story, this is where we're going. At the end of the day, when you think not one more awful thing can happen to the Apostle Paul, this guy is going to get bitten by a snake. And that seems to me to be what happens in the life of faith so often. Just when you think things can't get any worse, you reach out your hand. Finally, I'm going to catch a break. Only to get bitten by a snake. Has anybody here ever felt that in life you've been bitten by a snake whenever you can't take it anymore, when nothing else could go wrong, the other shoe drops, and, and you get called into the office, and it doesn't look good. You get the phone call from the doctor, and it doesn't look good. You get the phone call from one of your kids, and it doesn't look good. Your spouse sits you down at the table, and Life just does that to us sometimes. Life does that to us sometimes. When we think we can't take any more, God says, you're going to need to take a little bit more. But as that song so wonderfully reminds us, in the midst of these storms, even when we think it all is darkness, if we hold on to Christ, if we hold on to our faith, if we hold on to hope, I'm not going to paint you a better Rosa story that it is all going to work out, but there is a light. There is a reason. There is a purpose. There is God to be found in the midst of that storm, and he can do something amazing 
beyond our capabilities, beyond anything we knew to ask or imagine, beyond anything that we could have contrived, we could have conceived, we could not have orchestrated the events of tragedy and suffering sometimes in our life that can end up glorifying Him. And this is the life of the Apostle Paul. We first meet Paul on the road to Damascus when he is going to kill Christians. He has papers in hands. He's done all of the groundwork necessary to try and destroy the church, but God has a plan for him, and he calls him. You've probably heard the story. Jesus Christ himself is revealed to him. He tells him, go, and, and, he, and he goes, but he's blinded by this light, and, he, and he's in this house, and then God calls this other disciple named Ananias. And I, oh, I love this part of the story. I'm going to have to skip over a lot of stuff, obviously. Um, I, lo- I love how God tells Ananias, go and, you know, go pray for, for this guy named Saul, and he's I've heard that name. He's arrested my friends. We don't know. Maybe even his family members. He knows of the suffering that that Saul has caused. And and, and he he doesn't tell Ananias to tell this to Saul. He tells Ananias this. It's sort of like, don't don't worry, Saul. I'll give you the inside track. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Not the best way to call somebody in the ministry. I think maybe that's why he said we're going to keep that a secret from Paul for now. But, but I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. But, but through his ministry, the good news will go to the Gentiles and to the ends of the earth. Well, well, well Saul gets called. And an interesting thing, we, we, we can sometimes gloss over, forget the details of, of, of a life. Uh, so so I, we, I, won't make, I won't quiz you. We're not going to go into jeopardy mode here. So Saul gets called, and we think, you know, things were all rosy and things take off. You know, he went back to Tarsus, and, and you know what? Ten years. Ten years. He lived. He learned. He grew there, back in his hometown of Tarsus. God was preparing him more for the ministry it would take. That's just a word for anybody, uh, you know, thinking about your future, thinking about your education, thinking about what you want to do for God. Don't, don't be ashamed to go deep, to, to get the education, to get the discipleship, to get the learning, to get the, the, the building up that you need to do great things for, for God. So, so give yourself that gift and that time and that nurture. Saul becoming Paul took it. Ten years he was back in Tarsus, being prepared. And then about the 10-year mark, roundabout then, begins what we know to be these missionary journeys. Three missionary journeys are detailed in the book of Acts. There's a fourth that happens after that that then ends in Paul's execution in Rome. But the rest of Acts is then going to take us through three missionary journeys for, for Paul's life. At about 12-year mark after that, Paul's going to end up back in Jerusalem. He's been taking the gospel out to the world, but he's going to end up back in Jerusalem where the church was born. It was, you know, the birthplace of the church. He's kind of bringing it back home, like I'm bringing it back home here to preach out the gospel here. Um, but, but things aren't good in Jerusalem. And he gets into trouble with the Sanhedrin. He gets into trouble with the religious leaders. Uh, they don't like the message that is going out. They don't like that the Christian church, the followers of Jesus Christ, the followers of the way that it was called, are starting to grow, starting to outnumber the old. Uh, they're, they're, they're not happy as they're seeing the changes taking place around them. So they stir up the trouble for Paul, and, and they make some accusations, and, and, and they actually, they get, they get the leaders involved. And so they call in Felix, the governor, and we'll gloss over some things here, but they get him there before Felix, and they, they, they list out their troubles they have with Paul, and Paul makes his defense. And, and, and Felix really has no problem with, with Paul, except that the religious leaders, they, they won't let it go. They, 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 just, they just won't. Anybody know anybody who won't let it go? And they just will not. <laughs> they won't let it go. And so Paul ends up in prison for two years. Two years, Felix is like, well, until this is resolved, Paul just gets stuck in prison. What a, I mean, what, what a kick, you know, when you're doing these missionary journeys, you bring it home and you end up in prison. Out of that, of course, come some of the missionary, God has, God has amazing plans. Out of this come some of the letters that we've been edified by and instruct and guide us. So for two years, he's waiting for Felix to come down for a decision, and then Felix goes and dies on us. Well, Felix is replaced by Festus, the governor for the rest of us. 
Anybody catch the Seinfeld? Okay, anyways, no sign. You know, so Festus comes in and he becomes governor. Paul gets to come before Festus, and Festus says, I've got no problem with this, but Paul has made his appeal to Caesar. So, so Festus sends Paul uh, to, to Agrippa on his way to make an appeal before Caesar. And so there before Agrippa, what we find is that Paul makes this great, he kind of has this great uh, uh, testimony. And, and there's this great line where Agrippa's like, would you have me become a Christian, you know, in just one speech, you know, hearing one sermon? And Paul's like, well, yeah, if you're smart, you would, because Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. I've been away from Jesus. I've been on the Jesus plan. It's better. Like, so yes, you should get on the Jesus plan, Agrippa. And he's like, I won't have any thing to do with it. But it is at that that Paul has another vision from Jesus. And Jesus says, Paul, don't worry. Just as you've testified about me in Jerusalem, so you will go and give witness in Rome. And so Paul just has this assurance. He just has this confidence. He just has this peace. It's going to just pass all understanding that, that he's, he's going to make it. He doesn't know how, he doesn't know when, he doesn't know what's going to happen between point A and point B from here to there, but he is going to get there no matter what. And a lot is going to unfold between here and there. This brings us up to chapter 27, and we see Paul then being put on a ship. I'm just going to ask you to you know, open up your Bibles Keep your Bibles handy. You'll want to make some notes here. You'll want to make some references here. We're just going to end up speeding through a lot of 27 and 28 because there's, because there's so much good stuff in here. So what we find as we, we kick off chapter 27 is that uh, uh, Paul gets put on this ship with this guy named Julius, sort of the captain of the guard of this Italian cohort. And he's going to get put on the ship that eventually is going to make its way and get him uh, by a, you know, a very meandering route through the Mediterranean. He is going to get somehow, according to the plan, all the way to Rome. And so he gets put on, uh, on the ship and, and he's you know, heading off. And they finally, by about, uh, what are we in, about eight verses in, we're going to see that he finally ends up in this place called Fairhaven. And as he ends up in Fair Haven, what we read is that it's the end of the fast. Now, we know that according to the Jewish calendar, that would be Yom Kippur. And we know that this would be sometime after September. So he's living here somewhere in October because the rule was if it hits November, you, you don't continue any journey. Storm season is coming. But they need to weigh the pros and the cons. And so it says, Paul gives a speech. Paul says, hey, you know what? Uh, I have some experience in these matters. I've been on a few missionary journeys for the last now 14 some odd years. I've seen a few things. And it is my opinion that this is a bad idea. We are safe here. We're secure here. We can winter here. We have a good thing going on here. If anybody has ears to hear or listen to what I'm saying, we should stay put. But, we, but we're going to learn two things real quick here. One, we learn that uh, money talks and, and, and preachers walk sometimes. <laughs> that, that the money talks and it says that the ship's captain and the owner, they're like, we, we you know, you know th there's, there's dollars in Rome for us. So they want to get there. I mean, they, they're, they're merchants. I mean, this is how they make their living. This is, this is business for them. So they want to, they want to get to the paycheck. They, they want to, you can't blame them for that. And so I, I think their, their mind gets clouded. Their judgment gets, gets clouded because they're just looking at, at the dollar signs. And, and it's funny too, because, you know, the sailors, they're on, they're on board with it too. The sailors are like, we should press on and make it at least to Phoenix because everybody wants to spend their winter in Phoenix. Trust me, living in Colorado, what I know now is everybody wants to winter in Phoenix. Nobody wants to spend their winter in Fair Haven because Fair Haven is the little town. Fair Haven is the quaint, quiet, little, nothing much happens there in Fair Haven. But if they can get to Phoenix, 
Phoenix is a good, let me just tell you this. If there's anything I know about sailors, sailors like to party, sailors like to drink, sailors like to corral, sailors like to have a good time. Do you think I'm talking about myself? Shame on you. I'm just talking, no, no, it's, I'm, I'm a sailor. Get it, get it, sailor. Say no, but seriously, the sailors—they're like, they're like, we want to get to, we want to get to Phoenix. Like that, that'd be a better three months than 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 Fair Haven. And so, these guys—they—they—they—they they, 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 they listen. They listen to the sailors. They—they they, they listen to, to the call of money. Rarely, not always. Rarely does the crowd go with God's will. I and mean, that's not an indictment of all the time, every case on the crowd, but, but, but friends, very rarely does the crowd go with God's will. There, there's something about stirring up the people. There's something about stirring up the masses when you get money involved, when you get the possibility and the promise of better times in, involved, or at least a good time involved. The crowd rarely is going to see things, discern things, follow things through the lenses of God. God. And, and so it calls on the people of God to sometimes say, you know what, like Proverbs tells us, that there's a way that seems right to a man that leads to death. And, and that's what Paul's been trying to tell them. I, I get it. There's a way that seems right to, to, to all of you. But trust me, this could lead to literal death and destruction. Again, friends, this is just some bonus material here for, for us. Be the one be the man, be the woman, be the kid in your class, be, be, be the person at the office, be, be, be the one who says, there is sometimes is a way that seems right to the crowd, but if we examine this thoroughly, it could lead to destruction. It could even lead to death. And maybe we should examine a bit deeper what God would have us do in, in this situation. Well, they don't listen to wisdom. They don't listen to Paul. They decide that they are going to press on to Phoenix. And in verse 13, we, we read that they, they, they feel that they got the sign of it because it says a, a south wind blew. You know, just, you know, just, oh, isn't that nice, that warm southern breeze. They just think, oh, <laughs> things, this is going to be good. We're, we're going to make it, and everything is going to work out just, just fine. Except that one verse later, we find that as soon as they set sail, and as, almost as soon as that southerly wind is blowing, it says that, um, well, in, in your Bible translation, it may, it may say this, say the, the nor'easter came in. We, we know, I mean, we know about nor'easters even in this part of the world. The nor'easter came in. I, lo I, I love in, in the Greek, it's called the Eurocrylon. I mean, I mean that's a, doesn't that just sound bad? I mean, that sounds like, you know, it could be the next Mission Impossible movie, you know, MI8, the Eurocrylon. I mean, it just sounds bad when you name something. The Eurocrylon is coming. It's weighing. It's pressing down upon them. In fact, your Bible probably says it was a tempestuous storm. The Greek there is typhoon. No interpretation needed. It's a typhoon. Everything named typhoon is bad. A typhoon is bad. Having typhoon fever is bad. I mean, nothing good is named typhoon. So it's got this urocrylon. This typhoon is coming, weighing down on them. And they're so helpless, it says that they let the ship, when you get to verse 14, it says they let the ship drive itself. That, that, that's what we do with life sometimes. We just think, I, I just got to let the ship drive itself. We kind of let go of control when we say, I, I, don't, think I, I don't think I'm in control of, of this anymore. I, 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 as much as I tried to mitigate and mediate every possible case scenario, we find ourselves in lives sometimes where we're just letting the ship of our lives, we're just letting it drive itself. We're just letting it take over. It says that whenever they did this, that the ship was then dri being driven towards these sandbars off the coast of Tunisia, off the coast of north of Africa. And, and this is called the, the Sirtis, probably in, in your text it would say. This is a nickname for this. If you've got to study Bible, it's probably right there in your notes. It's called the Graveyard of Ships. I mean, that's what happens so often. When you let go, when you let the ship drive itself, what seems to happen is it ends up in that graveyard. 
seems to end up in that direction of death. It seems to end up in that destruction. It seems to end up going towards bad things. These guys that says, finally, actually, actually, the interesting thing here, what, what we read is, when we return in the chapter and we, we started reading this, we're paying attention to the, to the, um, uh, to the, the context of, of how our author uh, is writing. This is, uh, he is being penned by a man named Luke. Luke has one of the Gospels. And then this is follow-up. He's writing on behalf of uh, Theophilus. Uh, the, and, and he's referring to himself in the first person now, actually. And, and, and then Luke even writes... By the time we are getting down to, towards verse 20, it says that they, they lost all hope. Whenever you've let go of the wheel, whenever you're letting the ship drive itself, whenever you know you're heading to the, towards the graveyard of ships, it says that they, says they lost all hope. I mean, at this point, it's, it's anything goes. At this point, your priorities change. It says that they started jettisoning the cargo, about, about verse 17. It says uh, they, they're jettisoning the cargo. It means they're literally that thing that was so important to them a moment before, that thing that that, that thing that clouded their vision, that thing that they said, that, you know, nothing else matters more than getting to Rome and getting the paycheck. They're, they're just throwing it overboard. Talk about a priority <laughs> realignment. None of this matters if we end up in the graveyard. None of this matters when we're dead. They just start, they're, just, they're throwing dollars, you know, over the, over the sh- you, know, you, know, you know, whatever, just, just throw it overboard. It says they start jettisoning then the, the tackle of the ship, the very equipment that would be used to control the ship, that, that would guide them, that they would navigate the, this boat. But, I mean, they're like, it doesn't matter anymore. It does, I mean, none, none of this matters anymore as we're headed towards the graveyard. They're throwing this stuff overboard. I mean, they are in desperate, desperate mode. There's a spiritual lesson in that, of course. Hebrews tells us to cast off everything that weighs us down, every sin that hinders, every attachment that holds us back, everything that is keeping us from the direction that God wants us, that keeps us from moving forward in faith to where God has called us, everything that hinders and holds back, cast it off. These guys have had this priority realignment. They know now all that matters is life. All that matters is making it through this alive. The money doesn't matter. The tackle doesn't matter. Who's in charge doesn't matter anymore. Get it overboard. Lighten the ship. We need to be nimble. We need to be quick. We, we, we need to be aligned. To just try and get through this. Well, we lead a, cu- a couple verses. says they're, this is going to go on for some 14 days. But, but let me back up to this. To, to one of my favorite parts, actually, in this story. <clears throat> After about 14 days, they've, they've jettisoned all the cargo. The, the, the storm is, is, is not letting up. There comes this moment where things look really, really desperate. And then, and then finally, Paul gets up. And, and, and I love this. I mean, Paul, he gave his speech at the beginning. And, 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 and then they got set sail and the southern winds blew, you know. And, and, and then the storm came up. You know, but, but, but Paul, he just, he, 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 kept, he kept quiet. He says the storm became tempestuous and and, and he kept quiet. He, they started to throw out the cargo, and, and Paul didn't say anything. They start to throw out the tackle, and, and Paul doesn't say anything. He says they lost hope. And 14 days later, and then Paul finally gets up, and you know what Paul says? I told you so. And I just think for a moment we just have to just bask in the glory of that moment. Haven't we just wanted to tell somebody I told you so? I mean, come on, let's admit it. I, I, I mean, he gets this great moment, and he's like, I told you. I mean, I just want to live vicariously in that moment with my children. And how many conversations did I want to start? I told you so. How many times with friends? I told you so. How many times maybe with our church? I told you so. How many? I mean, how many? times do we want to say I told and Paul I mean just praise be to God he gets to say I told you so and 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 you know what if he would have ended it there I mean not much of a role model but he gets this moment I told you so (laughs) I told you this is not going to be bad he says but wait but don't but but I'm going to tell you now I'm going to tell you now there's hope in this you see Paul had another vision from from God God told him, you're not just going to end up in Rome. He said, during the night, an angel of the Lord appeared to me. And, and, and well, I'll give you the bad news and, and then the good news. People usually like that. Here's the bad news. You know, it, we're going to lose the ship. We are going to lose the ship. It is gone. I, I mean, just do, don't even think about it anymore. It's gone. He said, but listen, if you trust God, if you do what I say, Everyone on this boat is going to live. 
276 people, every one of us is going to live if we do what I, if you do what I say now. Uh, and he says he knows this because he had a vision that God, God said to him, you're not just going to go to Rome, you're going to bear witness before Caesar himself. If I can jump just ahead before I come back to the text for a moment, as we read then towards the end of the book of Philippians, next to last verse, you know what Paul says in that? He says to the church in Philippi, the saints of the household of Caesar send their greeting. The saints of the household of Caesar, there are things that maybe we just miss in how amazing they are, that Paul is actually going to make it to Caesar, and he didn't quite get through to a guy named Nero, we're not going to go into the history there, but there became believers in the household of Caesar who planted and led the church. In Rome. What's the book that follows Acts? What's the first book of the Bible after Acts? It's the book to the letter to the church in, in Rome. Paul knows. I, we're going to lose this ship, but, but I, mean, it's like, I mean, who's in charge now? Who is in charge now? Is the captain in charge anymore? No, no. Is the owner of the ship in charge any, anymore? No, no. Is, 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 are, are the sailors, are the soldiers in charge? Is Paul in charge now? Yeah, you, yeah, you guys get it. Pa Paul's not even in charge. God's in charge. God's in charge of this. But God's like, I'm hoping somebody's listening to me. I mean, what the world needs right now is some people that are saying, guess what, everybody? God is in charge, but some of us should be listening. And Paul's the one saying, God's in charge of this. He has given me the promise. He is going to get me to Rome. He's going to get me before Caesar. He has a mission. He has a purpose. He has an end goal in this. And God is with us in this. And, and, and everybody is going to live if we listen to God. The world needs some people listening to God and recognizing that God is in control. Well, he tells him, cheer up, we're all going to live, and it's, it's all going to, it's all going to work out. The 14 days they've gone out, and then, I mean, it unfolds. Here, we're just going to skip past to the end here. It's going to unfold, unfold exactly as you would want. I mean, exactly as you want. The storm rages. They, 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 they pull up the anchors. They hit a sandbar. It says the back of the ship is being torn to shreds. I think about that picture, that image from Indiana Jones, and I think it's the, the last crusade where the boat's getting chopped up by the propeller. I mean, that's what it says. The, the, from the back of the boat is getting beaten by waves, getting just, just pulled apart into splinters. And they say, everybody overboard, if you don't know how to swim, grab something that floats. And they all end up on the shore of the island of Malta. It is the Eurocrylon season. It is cold. It is raining. Even on this tropical island, the most beautiful island in all of the Mediterranean, Malta, they end up there. And it says the islanders took uncommon kindness and favor to them. They saw this storm. They saw that was happening. They're just, I mean, this is, I guess they're, you know, like Friday night entertainment. They're like, that looks really bad out there. But they see all these people come. It says they build a fire for them. Oh, finally, we're going to catch a break. Paul reaches down. He grabs this pile of wood. He's about to throw it on to the fire and right back to where we started. He gets bit in the hand by a snake. Of all things, can you believe it? He gets bitten in the hand by a snake. It says that he shook it off. It fell in the fire and the islanders, they're like, well, he must be a murderer because he just survived that shipwreck only to get bitten by a snake. And they don't give any advice, no counsel now. They're not like, you know, you should suck the venom out of that thing and spit it out or you know, tie a tourniquet or, you know, pee on it or do something. I mean, no, like no advice on what to do with the snake bite situation thing. They're just like, he's a murderer. This is going to be good. And they're like, he's not swelling up like the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man. He's not dying. Maybe he's a god. And isn't, isn't it just like the crowd to hate you one minute and to love you the next, to call you a murderer and then to think, be very, very careful of what that crowd that doesn't listen to you earlier says about you now. <laughs> Don't forget that they can turn on you 
in a heartbeat. Well, they're so impressed that he's alive, they take him to Publius. Publius's father has been sick for some time. Paul prays for them, and he gets well. He prays for others on the island as they get well. And as we are nearing then towards the end of 28, it says that three months later, they got back onto a ship that had wintered there and made their way to Rome, but they left behind, they left behind a church. And isn't it just like our God, through the storm, through the wreck, through the trials, through all the suffering, through all the struggles, after you think everything has been taken away from you, after you think everything has been driven off course, after you just think the whole plan has just gone, gone down the chute, after you think nothing has worked out, isn't it just like God three months later to leave behind where there was nothing before, to leave behind a church and to restore to you everything that the storm had taken? That's a good God who can leave behind a church where all you see, saw is loss, who can restore unto you everything that you thought the storm had taken and send you on your way with even more. There's a couple lessons from this that I'd like to just take a few moments. I can, I can take a few more moments, right? I gotta, yeah, um, it, it, let, me, let me leave you with three things as we think about this story. First thing, I want to come back to one of my favorite parts of the story. You know, you can start with I told you so, but you better leave them with I tell you now. <laughs> Friends, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to take this as the word of God. If I get, next time I get the chance to say I told you so to somebody, I'm taking it. I'm taking the I told you so moment. But I'm not going to leave them with I told you so. You got to leave them with but I tell you now. There's a lesson to be learned from the mistakes of the past, but there's hope to be found in the future with God. You can say, I told you so, but you better tell them, but I tell you now. I tell you now. I tell you now we can move forward in faith. I tell you now we can move forward in trust. I tell you now there is an opportunity for a better tomorrow. I tell you now that you can get your life straight. I tell you now that you can walk with God. I tell you now that you can do right in your marriage. I tell you now that you can honor your spouse. I tell you now that you can love your children. I tell you now that you can make a difference in your place of work. I tell you now that you can shine the light of the gospel in your community. I tell you now, no matter what the mistakes of the past, I tell you now, there is always a future with God and his plan. Amen, friends? Amen. The owner of the ship, the captain of the ship, they lost the ship. They lost the ship, but you know what they gained? They gained everything. They gained eternity. They gained Jesus Christ. They gained hope. They gained a future. They gained everything that they had dreamed for. And all it cost them was a boat. <laughs> That's a pretty good deal, friends. If it costs you the boat, give it up freely. Because you can gain the world in Jesus Christ. You can start with I told you so, but friends, please leave them with I tell you now and tell them about the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Second thing I want to leave you with, I, I, I like this one. Some people, some people bring the storm. Other people bring you through the storm. Some people bring the storm in our lives, but others are going to bring us through the storm. I read this one in an old commentary. That, that, that's a really good insight about this passage, that sometimes the choices of others bring storms into our lives. It was the choice of the sailors, the choice of the captain. It was the decision uh, of the owner to bring the storm into the lives of these men. But it was the actions of Paul that brought them through the storm. Friends, we can be the kind of people that bring the storm, or we can be the kind of people that bring people through the storm. You see, Jonah, Jonah, he had a boat experience. He had a shipwreck kind of experience. But it was Jonah who brought the storm. Paul had a shipwreck storm experience, but it was Paul who brought them through the storm. Don't be the one who brings the storm. Be the one who brings people through the storm. Our Jesus, he doesn't just go through the storm. He calms the storm, right? He's the one who calms the storm. You, you know what I mean? Sometimes, you know, before you even answer the phone, you just see who it is, and, and you, 
Oh, there's a storm coming. If I answer this call, there's a storm. When you walk in on Monday morning, some of you know the storm is coming. When you got something that you know you need to attend to, that you've been putting off for days, for weeks, for months maybe, you know the storm is coming when you walk into that situation. But I believe that with Jesus Christ, you can be the kind of person who then is going to bring people through that storm. I just want to have a moment maybe with just, just the fathers, fathers here, just because I'm a father. I know a lot of dads who bring the storm. I've done ministry with a lot of families where I know when dad walks home, the storm comes. When dad gets home from work, everything breaks loose. Dads, be the dad who calms the storm. Because when you get home, chances are your kids went through a heck of a storm at school. Or they're going through a storm right now on their team. They're going through a storm with some of their friends. Your your wife, she's going through a storm with some things that are going on with her parents. She's going through a storm with some things that she's dealing with with your kids. She's going through a storm with some things that are happening in the health of your extended family. There are some storms going on in your family's life. I know it. I sympathize with it. But dads, be the one who's going to bring your family through those storms. Don't bring the storm Bring them through the storm, all right? Will you be the kind of men who bring your families through these storms of life by the faith that you have in Jesus Christ? One last thing. This this is the best point. This is point three. Point three, and then we're going to wrap it up here. Point three, and then I promise I'm going to close. Point three, shake it off. Somebody say, shake it off for me. Someone say, I'm going to shake it off. Anybody, uh, somebody say, I'm a shake, shake. No, t- no Taylor Swift fans in the house. You know, does anybody know what I'm, I, 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 come on. I'm going to shake, shake, shake it off. Shake, woo hoo hoo. I thought, David, I thought you told me they were responsive people here. So, so friends, friends, sometimes we've got to shake it off because the best point of this story is that what the evil one intended to kill Paul, Paul used as fuel for the fire. Can I get an amen on that one? I mean, what the evil one intended to kill Paul, Paul uses as fuel for the fire. Friends, you can shake it off. You can cast it. You can use what the evil one intends to kill you. Use it for fuel for the fire. He intends that job loss to bring you down. It can become fuel for the fire of your mission. He intends for that health crisis to take you out. It can become fuel for the mission of taking care of yourself and taking care of the people around you. I could go on and on, friends, but you get it. You know where I'm going with this. You can take what the evil one intends to steal and to kill and to destroy your life and you need to shake it off and you need to use that as fuel for the fire. Don't be defeated by the bites of life. Shake it off and use it as fuel for the fire because that is what our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, did. From the very beginning, that was the plan and we see its fulfillment. From the very beginning, we are told that he will strike his heel, but you, Jesus, you will crush his head. And when Jesus got bit on that cross. It looked like he was going to die. When Jesus went into that grave on Good Friday, the evil one thought that he had won. But friends, Jesus shook it off. He shook off that serpent. He shook off that snake. He shook off that sin. He shook off that grave. He shook off those grave clothes. And he said, I'm going to use it as fuel for the fire to send my church out in mission. Amen, friends? Shake it off and use it as fuel for the fire. Let me pray for you. Do we sing after this or we just, we just, we we, now, oh great, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to pray good then. Then we're going to, we're going to, we're going to pray. And, and, and friends, I, you know, I'm the guest. I came in and you welcomed me, but I, I would be remiss if I did not give you the opportunity to join with me in a prayer. To just give all, surrender all and leave it with the Lord, and put your trust in Him. So, so, so wherever you're at, maybe you've prayed a prayer like this a hundred times, maybe you've never prayed like this before. I, I don't know where you're at, but I'm going to pray for you. And if and you just join your heart and pray with me. He- Heavenly Father,
I thank you so much for this opportunity that you've given me to bring your word here at West Hills. And what a joy and what an honor, what a delight that it has been. And, and Lord, I just want to pray for, for Pastor David. I want to pray for the, for the people here. And I want to pray for the blessing of this church, Lord. What a miracle. What an amazing thing that you've done. What an amazing thing that you are doing. And I pray that you keep growing your church and make her beautiful make her spotless, make her blameless, use her gloriously in this community until you come again. <clears throat> and until then, Lord, I want to pray for these people. I want to pray for the, for the men, for the women, for the children of this congregation, that they would know you, that they would love you, that they would live fully surrendered and devoted lives to you. And so, Lord, all of us together as your people, we recommit our lives to you, Jesus Christ. We confess our sin, our shortcomings, confess that we sometimes have gone the way of the world and we've not listened to your voice, but we, 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 we shake off that past now. We move forward with you. We move forward in faith with you, trusting you, Lord Jesus Christ, that there is a hope, that there is a future, there is forever in you and forever with you and the promise that we have. So Lord, touch and fill this congregation, these men and women, with the power of your Holy Spirit. Fill them with your gifts, fill them with your fruits, fill them with your power that they may follow you faithfully and be your ambassadors until you come again. We, we pray this in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Thank you so much for the blessing of giving God's word. Thank you.